typical clients, all right. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi. This uh, is a panel. <laughs> we had 200 people sign up for this, uh, and I was sure like three people would come. Uh, so you proved me a little bit wrong. <laughs> Not <laughs> easy wrong. <laughs> uh, don't start recording this yet, please. <laughs> People are excellent. So we already understand how kids are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were not lying. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is Fundraising Unveiled, a candid conversation with executive directors. Uh, and that definitely extends to the people in this room. We have more executive directors here and philanthropy officers in this space, uh, so we're going to try and keep our answers fairly short uh, so that we can get into the questions, because I know we're not going to hit everything, uh, we don't have all the answers. The three of us are in a few different executive director groups. Um, I kind of view them a bit like therapy sessions, uh, so to me this feels like a little bonus therapy session you'll get to take part in with us. Um, similar challenges and questions and issues come up. I think fundraising as an executive director is hugely challenging uh, and hugely rewarding and yeah we're looking forward to getting into uh getting into all of it with you so on the stage we have monica chair <laughs> executive director at new roots um, which was nine years old and known as factory farming awareness coalition when monica took over in 2019 um, and then we have brooke haggerty from Fornalytics, uh, Executive Director of Fornalytics, um, and uh, Brooke uh, took on that role in like January 2020, um, and I didn't realise this until actually quite recently, but at that point, Fornalytics was 20 years old. Like, that is just incredible. Uh, and myself, Anna, um, I am Executive uh, I'm Executive Director at Sentient, and I took on that role in 2020, uh, January as well, like Brooke. Um, but at that point, Sentient was only about a year old. So we all have pretty different stories, and we really want this to be like the start of a discussion that hopefully we can have and continue and support each other over the next few days here at Ava. Um, so we'll get into it. We're going to start by uh, sharing a little bit about our, our kind of approaches, if you call it that, um, towards fundraising. Um, and we're going to start with Monica. Uh, so, like, my question to Monica is, like, you know, what's your background in fundraising? What's your approach? And um, do you even like it? <laughs> Solid question, Dan. <laughs> Tell them a joke. This is candid, okay? And I just feel like we need to open up by acknowledging that wealth is not equitable in the entire world. And I think that it's very challenging for people when they look at philanthropy and they learn how absurd it can be sometimes. And so part of my goal here is to speak very candidly about how I deal with those realities and some of the challenges that I have because I came in directly after a very loved founder, Katie Cantrell, who I adore. She founded Factory Farming Awareness Coalition in 2010, which meant for nine years she had built up a donor relationship base. The moment I became EG, we lost quite a few donors. <laughs> So that's, you know, a cult of personality, and that's sometimes part of the challenge of being an executive director is so fundraising. So fundraising, raise your hand if you directly have fundraising in your title. Okay, so like six people or something like that, right? Not a lot of people have fundraising in their title, and yet a lot of you might work with organizations as board roles, as uh, folks who represent the organization, work with an organization, care yeah. deeply, and represent us in some way, and I would, get, I would guess that a lot of you do play a really important role in fundraising. And what I've learned is that it's essential for me as an executive director to create the ecosystem for our entire team to be successful in doing this work and sharing our stories and representing us. And I think that what I've learned is that you really have to be yourself. And I'm going to speak very candidly about this. I am, I was not somebody who always felt like I could be myself when I was engaging in fundraising and donor relations. And if you are not yourself in the way that, if I said to you, for example, I really like your shoes, but I didn't mean it. I was trying to make a connection, but it was inauthentic to me. Then everybody could see right through that. That's, but really trust 
donor relationship, etc. that's built upon authenticity. And so what I'm really going to encourage everybody to do is push to always just be who you are, of course, like a polished version of yourself. <laughs> but you have to be who you are, you have to find those points of connection. And if you do that, then you'll be doing this work wholeheartedly. And doing that work wholeheartedly related to the previous conversation that just happened in this exact room, <coughs> being wholehearted is how you're going to avoid that burnout. And that's how I've come to really enjoy my job. I totally agree with that, Monica. I think, to your question about do we enjoy it, I used to hate fundraising so much. I was a fundraiser in all capacities in previous roles, from grant writer to uh, an individual donor stewardship manager to an event coordinator who needed to get sponsorships for fundraisers. And it all just felt so transactional. It just felt like, please give us $1,000 so that we can save 100 lives and none of it is going to go to anything else and you're the star here. And I just really hated fundraising. I, I really did not enjoy it at all. And it wasn't until I started thinking about being authentic, building relationships, having a few trust base that I really, uh, it turned a corner for me. It made me really enjoy the idea of fundraising because I don't think about it as fundraising anymore. I think about it as relationship building. When you're communicating with donors, whether it's someone who gives $5 once a year or $100,000 or whatever it is, uh, being just who we are, representing our organizations and our fellow organizations to the best of our ability uh, really made it much more enjoyable for me. And a little bit more of what Monica was saying about like who's actually got fundraising in their title versus who fundraises, I bet most people at this conference fundraise even if they don't know it. I wouldn't be able to fundraise without my team members and uh, it really takes it takes the whole team to do it. So thinking about it in that relation, that relationship building way was a really meaningful way for me to um, really enjoy the work I do now. How about you, Emma? Yeah, so I was in a very different position to Monica and Brooke and probably maybe there's some people who have similar experience in the room, but I was new to running a nonprofit. Uh, it was a brand new organization, pretty much. Um, I was new to what America is, um, like all of this stuff <laughs> that like, is HR and stuff, it's very different. Um, and uh, yeah, we had a brand new intervention, like thinking of the media in this way. Um, and then COVID hit, and I basically got marooned in the UK uh, and couldn't build any relationships with anybody, <laughs> and I couldn't meet anyone, I couldn't learn anything. Um, and I essentially, you know, I, I actually have board members in this room right now, but I did essentially like ignore fundraising for the first year of my role at Sentient. Um, and I didn't mean to, but um, I was leaning into strategy. And we'll get into probably some pros and cons what came out of that later. But like, for me, um, this idea of like learning is I think my favorite thing when it comes to fundraising because Honestly, every single conversation that I have with a donor or you know a supporter, like whoever, people just you know other executive directors, every single conversation that I've had in the last four and a bit years, I've learned so much. And in that first year, I spoke to so many donors, but not about money, just about strategy. And I was saying, this is what we're going to do. This is uh, what I'm thinking. Is that does that make any sense? Like, does that resonate? Um, and eventually, some of those people became donors. Some of them didn't, we still talk about strategy together. Um, but it, yeah, it, it wasn't an intentional thing, it just kind of happened organically. Uh, and that's what I still do today. And I honestly love it. Like, I love that approach. Well, I love that relationship uh, with every single one of our supporters, uh, including our leader supporters who, like, are our bread and butter, they keep us going. Um, but doing the relationship building stuff, like, yeah, before in my first year I didn't do any fundraising, I then basically pivoted to be 100% fundraising. I basically consider every conversation that I have with anybody something to do with fundraising. Like, any conversation with my team, I'm like, okay, what are the stories I can get from what you're saying that I can share with our community? Um, but building relationships when you're an executive director and you have to deal with, like, American HR is really hard and complicated and it takes a lot of time and you have to really be careful about prioritization and what you what should you do this day? There are 20 fires to put out. Uh, how do I prioritize? What do I do? Um, and this is one of the things that like intrigues me so much about what Brooke did at Fornomatics, 
Because this was an organization, as I said, I learned recently, was 20 years old when Brooke took it on, and then grew like, what, three, three times the size in about three years. Like, how? Yes. To me, it's not really fundraising for a year, that's wild. Um, <laughs> how, like, yeah, like, can you share the why and how you like, made those priorities and how you did that? I feel like it might have been four, but still. <laughs> Um, so I am lucky enough to have another fundraiser on my team now, her name is Liz, and she's freaking awesome. She's hiding, she's streaking. Um, so when I came on Moa, we didn't have a dedicated fundraiser, it was the executive director doing everything, and that's really what we kind of wanted to focus a little bit of this panel about, is how you balance everything. And for me at the time, it was the non-negotiable admin work first, like filing taxes and doing things that the organization would if you didn't do it. And then it was fundraising, and then it was everything else. And it's really hard to balance the everything else. And something that really helped me, both when I was alone and still with Liz, is putting together the fundraising infrastructure. So for me, that meant putting together case for support statements. What is our mission? What are our programs? What's our impact? However, the different ways we can word that depending on our audience. That way we're not reinventing the creative writing wheel every time we have to write a grant or every time we have to pitch a donor. Um, another thing we did was try to set up platforms for international donors to give so that we could give tax write-offs to other people in other countries. And we also started to get our organization out there on third-party platforms so that people can think about or be introduced to us um, even though we're not actively in front of those people. We get our name out on these other third-party fundraising platforms. And if that's uh, something that's new to you, find Liz afterward and she can tell you about that. Um, and something that really helped me was putting together a realistic fundraising plan. So that meant putting in writing, because that's kind of the way I work, um, what is our plan for donor stewardship once someone donates to us? What are we literally doing to engage them? When are we doing it? Um, because it's like lapsed donor rate in the nonprofit sector is like 47% or something. So we really need a plan for how to engage our current donors. It meant putting a plan together for cultivating new donors. Um, and part of that was understanding what a realistic timeline is for donor cultivation. It can take years to get a new donor to commit to you or to get someone who's interested in your cause, especially if, they, uh, if you're talking about larger uh, gift amounts. It can take months to years to cultivate that, and so knowing that we're kind of in for the long haul and, and setting those expectations accordingly was really helpful. Um, outlining how board members can support you. I think a lot of people think that fundraising is making an ask, but that's not always the case. Board members can make soft intros, they can make thank you calls or write thank you notes. There are a lot of ways to engage people in ways that are less scary if people aren't used to fundraising. And I, one other thing I'll just mention too is the fundraising plan helped me outline what do I want to do versus what do I have the capacity to do? How do I prioritize my time? I have all these ideas, I'll get to them one day, but what can we actually do now? And the other thing I do want to flag is that research can help fundraising. It doesn't just help advocacy, so it doesn't, uh, it can help everyone no matter your role. So there are things like the goal proximity effect. People are more likely to give to your campaign the closer you are to your fundraising goal. There are things like immediacy bias. People are more likely to give if there's an urgent nature to it. They think of that as more deserving. It's fresh in their minds and there's that urgency. Um, donate button details. We've worked with our content director on this. What should our donate page look like? Things like placement and even color. There are cultural associations with color. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can experiment with the little details that don't necessarily seem like, oh, if I do this, I'm going to raise a million dollars, but it all adds up together. Um, and then when you ask, making an ask is pretty strategic. So getting to know your, uh, when people engage with your emails, um, investing in donor software, which doesn't have to break the bank, um, to help you understand um, how you interact with donors, how often you've done so. All of these little things helped me tremendously. But Anna, I know you took a totally different approach. Yeah, no surprises the person with no fundraising experience didn't set up uh, some kind of content management system immediately. So no, no, no. Uh, we actually um, 
didn't have anything in place um, for the last like four years, apart from like my inbox and maybe an upsetting looking Trello board. Um, but we have now got a development coordinator who's working with me on uh, how sort of like putting a lot of the conversations that I've had, a lot of the learnings that I've had from conversations uh, into some kind of something that makes sense. Um, and I can totally like hear from what Brooke is saying, like you need to have something in place in order to sustainably grow. Like our plans are to obviously keep growing and if we're gonna do that, we need to have some system in place. But I guess like I'm deeply inspired by what Brooke just said. Um, and I think that it can be a bit daunting um, looking at all of the content management software and processes and all of the data behind all of this stuff. It can be a bit daunting to look at. So I would also just kind of add like, you know, starting somewhere is fine and wait till you're at that point. Like, yeah, like I'm saying, like it's been four years of just doing what we're doing, but we've still been growing year on year. Um, so don't worry if you're not at that point yet, <laughs> would be my only uh, kind of comfort blanket. Um, but uh, the other thing that we were going to get into as well is like how you can bring like your supporters, your donors along on a journey with you. And like Monica, uh, as you all know, we, brand, we went through a huge rebrand that unveiled at last AVO from FFAC to New Roots. Um, and you brought donors along like on that journey whilst also expanding your budget and expanding your like operating budget and, and your support. So yeah, tell us more about that. Okay. <laughs> Look, <laughs> this is fundraising and failed with executive director. So like all the stuff that you just said, Brooke, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a CFRE. What I do know is that there's a lot of things that you can be doing. You can be doing galas, you can be doing direct mail, and everything can make you feel very insecure that like you're not doing all these things. And what I've learned is that it's ultimately about capacity and what you want to prioritize. And for New Roots Institute, our biggest issue, I believe, is that we didn't have a very solid strategic plan. We didn't have good metrics for the work that we were doing. And we had this buckshot approach of just trying to reach as many people as possible because we want to get the lowest cost per person reached. And when we evolved into New Roots Institute, we started to be a lot more strategic. We don't just take any lesson at any random school. We're trying to focus on schools where we are recruiting fellows to work on campaigns in those same schools where those students are now very receptive to eating plant-based. That's a very specific culture shift strategy. And once we had that story, that's when everything started to change. I'll also add that I am now spending a lot of time in different movements, the environmental movement, the youth development movement. For those of you who are in this audience who are executive directors and starting out and just beginning your budgeting, I want to really note that even though it's hard, challenge fundraising can sometimes be hard, we are actually really blessed in this space. I have never seen another space where the farm animal funders, where the big grantors, everybody's getting together, they're creating lists, they're trying to support uh, some of the smaller groups with you know $1,000 grants, $5,000, $10,000 grants to help you get to that point. Because New Roots Institute, you know, five years ago, we didn't have a strong strategy. And without that, we were still at that much lower level. It's when you really thought about what the needs are, how you fit into the landscape, that's what will really push your fundraising, at least in my experience, over your budget that we were looking for. Um, and then there are, all, of course, like all these failures <laughs> and all the things that didn't go so well. I could feel like maybe, Brooke, you want to start us off, and then I have so much to say. <laughs> uh, no, maybe Anna. Either way. Anyone? Um, something that I think, I mean, it was a failure in that we didn't raise money, but I think it was a learning opportunity. Um, so all of us, we're all talking about how do we bring in new donors to this movement. Every fundraiser here stays awake at night thinking about how to diversify our funding. And so a year or two ago, we really leaned into more grant writing. We were like, okay, we are going to try to apply to more grants. We have a philanthropy person now. Let's really like, try to diversify in that way. And so I don't think we were going after just everything. I think we were somewhat strategic about it, but we more than doubled the amount of grants we applied for. And the ROI, the return on that was very low. Uh, to me, it was very low. It was like 20%. And research has shown that it's usually around like 30% with new grants, higher if you're renewing a grant. So we put all this effort into trying to diversify our funding and it felt like we didn't get anywhere and we spent so much time on it. 
And so something that we did differently was put together an actual structure for assessing which grant opportunities to pursue. So what is the time investment of this grant application? Is it half an hour of our time or is it several hours because it's a bazillion pages long? What's the grant award amount? Is it $500? Is it $50,000? And then how strong of an alignment is it? Is it weak? Is it moderate? Is it strong? And visualizing that was like a game changer for helping us decide how to spend our time with new grants. And I just wanted to share that because I think we're all like trying to be like, I'm not doing something. I must be doing something wrong because I haven't raised that money or I haven't landed that gift. And I just hope that that anecdote can reassure anyone if you've been applying for grants and keep getting rejections or maybe you haven't applied for as many grants as you wanted. Um, don't worry, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. We are all really, really trying our best, and it's hard. Um, how about, what, what do you think? How do you, how do you handle rejection? Oh, um, <laughs> that's so there. There's a session right here. Wow. I don't know if I want to be that candid. Um, I don't like rejection. No. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, if, you know, if we're thinking about like some of these failures that we had, everything, you know, that we're saying, if, like, that Monica and, and, and Brooke are talking about is definitely resonating with me. Like, um, I, I, I think that like for us, like one of the areas that actually really helped us in hindsight, but was awful at the time, um, was that first year where I didn't spend any time, you know, really fundraising or building that fundraising strategy. I did build a really strong, you know, organizational strategy. And we were very clear, like, this is what we need to do. This is the gap and you all need to, Pay, like give us money like immediately um and like when it came to like the end of 2020 um like we weren't in a good place financially but we did have that really strong strategy and it was only because we had that strategy that we then managed to raise some pretty significant grants that helped us grow into the organization you know that we're still we're still growing into now um but yeah you're totally right like if you don't have your strategy nailed like it's really hard but when you're trying to define that strategy and you don't have money, like you want to say yes to everything, anyone who's throwing money at you for like some weird little program that's totally not really to do with your core topic, uh, you still want to say yes. Um, so I do want to flag that like thinking in your strategic planning about when to say no is really important too. Um, and for us as a media organization, it's pretty straightforward because if a donor, you know, donors and whether that's financial or in-kind support, they can't uh, influence our editorial, right? So if a donor says to me, like, I want to give you X to write a story about this or use this source, I have to say no. Um, because it's just fundamentally, it would undermine our whole strategy. And I've done that, like, a couple of times, uh, and it's really hard. Um, but one time when I did do it, it was actually turned into a bit of a success, is I said, no, you can't do it because you know, that's not how non-profit media works. And they said, oh, I didn't realize, we'll give you the money unrestricted. And it's like, that's brilliant. You know, that's a moment because I stood up for, you know, what we're doing and our strategy, it actually turned into some, you know, a moment for that donor if they want to fund other non-profit media, now they know how to do that. And yeah, it, it, it ended up being pretty cool. But it can end up leading to um, mission drift if you end up in this situation where you're just saying yes to everything. Um, and I feel like Monica, you have so much insight, so much to say about this mission just kind of thing based on that, you know, your last answer about strategy. Like, could you tell us, yeah, tell us a bit more about that? Well, it's just because we mission drifted so much. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to give us twenty thousand dollars to do a tofurkey shot? Okay. <laughs> we work with high schoolers, but okay, <laughs> yes, we'll do that. We do Green Monday. We do concert outreach, like, because that's related to education and raising awareness. And one of the funders told me at one point that she could not describe what Factory Farming Awareness Coalition did. Now that's honest, right? Like if she, as one of our largest funders, cannot describe what we do, we have a really serious problem. I think that there was a time when I took everything so personally. I, when you're applying for those grants and you don't get them, I, can, I compare it to like when I was a teenager and I'd like get all dressed up to like hopefully be attractive and it's like, no, I'm not interested in you <laughs> kind of situation. That's what those rejections felt like. And it took, it took me like honestly just growing a whole lot and not only understanding myself but like my role 
and how I am not the mother of New Roots Institute. I represent New Roots Institute. Eventually, there will be another executive director who is New Roots Institute. If our funding changes, we will make hard decisions. If our funding grows, we will make happier decisions, basically. But it's not tied to who I am as a person, my work. And I've also learned that communicating with other folks, like in this example, there's the three of us. We, and I also want to acknowledge that there could be a lot more people up on this stage. There could be all of you, realistically. So I am very <laughs> humbled that we get to be up here when I, I've learned so much from other people who know a lot more about fundraising and have been doing it for longer than I have. They've mentored me. And the people, um, many of whom are in this room, have helped me get to where our budget has gotten. And that's because who, is, who are your biggest allies? It's us, it's each other. You know, the, there are so many funders who ask, who else should we fund? That encourages all of us to not just think about ourselves, but to think about the whole movement. And I always say, if New Roots Institute won all the funding, that wouldn't be very good for the movement because there are so many different strategies and interventions. We do need media, we do need research, we need all of this. So last year we talked about movement-centric fundraising, movement-centric orientation, so it's where hardly anybody came. <laughs> so now it's, now it's more specifically about fundraising, but I want to make sure that this message really comes across. I think of New Roots as very much being like a bit of a backbone organization that's amplifying the work of a lot of organizations, especially the ones that want to work with you. And we do that, we don't have New Roots label chapters or anything, we're happy to support everybody. Um, and which is not to say that every nonprofit should be equally funded either. I think that, again, I care very deeply about strategy. But I do want to make sure that it's understood that the recommendations we make of each other, the critical feedback that we give to each other, that is perhaps like the greatest gift that I can provide, is because it shows you how much I care. If I just tell you, oh, that's, that's really nice, and then I walk away and I don't give you funding, or if I just say that in a very dismissive way, like, you're amazing, you're incredible, and then don't do anything, that I think really sucks. Um, I would encourage everybody to join an organization like Women Funders in AR, or like, you know, there's a gay and all over. There's all these different spaces where I've learned how to become a funder. I've, I've looked at 60 grant applications and only been able to give away grants for four groups. And that really changes how you think about your, the resources that you're taking up in this movement. I, I really just, want to echo like if, if you feel isolated as a fundraiser please come talk to us or talk to each other like it's a game changer to feel this kind of support and i feel it with many of you that i see in the audience and if you don't feel that and if you feel that you're alone then come find us because we're here to support you i think something to to monica's point about mission drift and supporting one another um it's okay that not every funder is going to support us. Like, not every funder cares about research. Not every funder cares about media or whatever. <laughs> I know. I don't think um, And that's okay. It's okay to know that not everything is going to be perfectly compatible with every donor in the space. And so embracing that movement-centric mindset of, okay, you're not into the research we're doing. Cool. What are you into? Oh, I know that New Roots is kicking ass at doing this specific thing. I know that Apex Advocacy is doing this specific thing. I know what's going on in the movement and making those connections is part of what I think makes fundraising fun now is being in that relationship building and connection space. Yeah, there is absolutely, I really don't think, I mean, we have an amazing board at Sandy and the support of our board has been so incredible, but the support of the executive director of the community like, there is no way that I think I would be here today without many of you in this room and these two are here. Like, 100% <coughs> candidly speaking, um, yeah, we're here for you. If you are feeling that isolation, I just want to echo what Brooke said, like, 100 million percent yes. Um, but yeah, please pop your questions into the thing so that we can open this up a bit more. And also vote because there's so many ties right now, so how do I choose which one to <laughs> My internet doesn't work in here, so I can't help you. Yeah. Oh. Monica, while you're choosing, I just want to let you all know that we are going to pop a link to a document we've prepared somewhere in the that I don't know, we'll figure that yeah, out. Um, we have, like, a, it's a short like, two-page document where we put together a list of the public-facing foundations and funders in the movement, because we don't, we don't know what other people do or don't know. So we wanted to make sure that everyone had a list that is in our brains. Um, and there's a few lists floating around. So we tried to put together a list of foundations in the space that are okay being publicly named. 
Um, there are links to some awesome talks that Monica gave in collaboration with Apex Advocacy last year. Um, there's the outline of a fundraising plan template and just a few other resources for you. So once I figure out how to work Hoopa and once the internet is working, um, that will be in this, in the app. We'll put it in the comments, I think. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, audience. You now have five minutes for a question. <laughs> All right, Anna or Brooke, apart from getting, whoa, <laughs> apart from getting unrestricted funding, what are the most challenging kinds of programs to fundraise for? Uh, Wait, I'm sorry, other than unrestricted? Mm -hmm. uh, well, for, uh, for us, research is like a second degree removed. So we're not saving animals' lives. I can't claim to have saved 100 animals. I can't say I um, gave out 100 clicks. <coughs> or I don't. We, we're one step removed, and so it can be really hard to demonstrate direct impact. And a lot of donors still want to see that. They want to say, "Well, if I give this, what am I getting for it?" And what I've tried to do is lean into again the relationship building, kind of explaining. Okay, well, I can't tell you that I saved X amount of animals, but let me tell you how our work helps other organizations in the space. But it's still, we're still evolving as, as a nonprofit sector, trying to move away from that transactional mindset, move away toward donor-centric you know, metrics and, and toward trust base. And, and for me, research is here. Yeah, I think just quickly add on to that, like it's similar with media. Uh, and I think one of the things that I've been explaining a lot today even to various donor meetings I've been in, like in the last two months we've had the two biggest wins at Sentient, but it has taken five years to get to that point. Like with research, with media, even with education as well, like it can take a really long time to see like the output and to see impact in a way that a lot of people think about impact. Um, and we've done a lot of work at Sentient on how we are picturing and thinking and measuring around impact that I'm very happy to share with anybody who wants to follow up with me. Okay, well, one of the other top questions that now has 11 votes is how do you measure and show impact to your donors? So, Anna. <laughs> oh, um, what have I done? Uh, yeah, like, it's hard. Um, we, when we're looking at media, we try and break it down. I mean, this is very specific to media though, but we try and break it down in terms of like our reach, like our journalists, like our, the outlets that we're getting out into. Um, we talk a lot about collaboration with other newsrooms. I feel like all of my answers are very going to be like very media centered, and I don't know how useful that is. But I think that if you're, as long as you're, when you're communicating to a donor, you're explaining like what the picture is within the movement as a whole. I think that that can be useful. Like, why is it important that we have media? Like, you know, why is it important that animal agriculture is covered in the media? For the movement at large, sometimes thinking like that can be helpful, but yeah. Maybe storytelling too. Like, it can be really easy to rely on page views and downloads and quantitative impact results, but being able to tell a story for us about how an organization utilizes research in a really exciting way, um, I think makes for a more interesting case for impact demonstration um, and brings them along on. A journey that helps them really understand, and like, click. Oh, okay. Now I get how research is being used, and hopefully that's applicable to other organizations too. Thinking about the story you can tell with the numbers, and not just the numbers themselves. I have value metrics, and I think most nonprofits, including FFAC, did a really poor job of actually demonstrating impact because we felt a lot of pressure to have very large numbers. I'm talking like 50,000 students reached at the lowest cost per person. And that was really disadvantageous for us. It's taken us a long time to really be clear on our theory of change and how we're going to be measuring that. So I imagine that some of you are running into a similar challenge and I offer myself that <laughs> somebody will be very critical and support you in that. I have a vision <laughs> at this point. I want a more, a stronger, more coordinated movement with all the nonprofits. And that's why I think it's so valuable that we're up here chatting with each of you. I think that the executive directors need to be talking to each other and sharing more. The development directors need to be talking and sharing with each other more. Operations directors, like everybody in similar roles across the organizations. I think that we also need to be looking at how we're measuring our progress as a movement, not our progress as an organization, where it's really easy, right, to be like, oh, the easy metric is like, we got 1,000 likes, new OKR, 2,000 likes. 
what, does that actually show that we make progress on the movement? No, but it's a, like an easy vanity metric number, right? So the big question that I have is, how do we know that we're making progress as a movement? What indicators can we point to? And that's part of like a large, larger conversation. That I think really relates to one of the questions that's about how funding perpetuates inequity. How do we move away from donor-centric fundraising to community-centric, or as we like to call it, movement-centric fundraising? Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so I think we've already touched on highlighting like fundraising for each other. Fundraising, not just for Bonalytics, not just for Sentient, not just for your groups. Fundraising for anybody we know who's doing awesome work. Um, something we've started doing at Faunalytics is every Giving Tuesday we put out a blog where each of our staff members chooses another organization in the space um, run by a person of color and who just isn't getting the attention they deserve. We're not evaluating these charities, we just have some favorites as fellow advocates in the movement. So we have a blog, put it on Giving Tuesday, and our hope is that other donors and our donors will then be introduced to these new organizations that are being neglected because um, the numbers are there. I, I think we talked about this on a previous panel at one point. Like it's, it's just ridiculous what an advantage we have as white fundraisers. And so anything we can do to shine a spotlight on the great work being done by others who might not have the same capacity to build relationships with donors or they don't have those relationships yet, um, we try to highlight. Yeah, I also think there's like an element of it is definitely like I, I feel it's a big responsibility to understand and know how to like pitch every organization in the movement. Like, you know, what is it that you know new groups are doing? That I could just say in a sentence and somebody, you know, is going to get it. Like, I, I, I'm talking, you know, in many of the organizations in this room, like, it is important that we know what each other are doing to your point, Monica, of like having this movement centric approach because then we can talk accurately and eloquently about it and then when we meet a donor who is interested in something that's not to do with media i know exactly okay well you need to speak to this person and this person um, and i feel I, I take that as a huge responsibility um, and a huge privilege to be able to have those conversations when i can excellent okay so this question i'm wondering if you're going to have to go and look at your computers it's how is your current fundraising broken down between major donors smaller one-time donors monthly donations etc Maybe the exact numbers aren't so much important. It's like how you're doing this, but maybe I guess like it, it might be interesting to kind of think about like reliance on major donors, perhaps. So like for us, it's sent. I can I, I can say so. Um, so um, for us at Sendium, um like forty percent of our funding is from uh, one major donor, um, and then the sixty percent that breakdown would then probably be like maybe like eight to ten would be like small gifts um, and the rest would be kind of like mid to large gifts which for us is like you know 25 to 100 um, type breakdown uh, so that would be like a kind of statistical look at, at, at it and i think that the approach yeah oh. i am trying to imagine the breakdown um so our hopefully projected revenue is almost 1.5 million this year and I would say half a million of that comes from donors who give five or six figures. Um, so a decent amount still comes from the collective, um, just your average person like, like us who just want to donate even if it's only 20 bucks. Um, but I don't hold me on that. I'm so sorry for whoever asked this question. I don't have those exact breakdowns in my head. If you care. <laughs> Monica, you raised. Yes. Institute's budget for fiscal year 25, which starts July 1, is going to be 2.3 million. About 50% of our budget comes from our largest donor. And that is significant because it used to be 90%. What I have learned is that nobody likes it when you are reliant on them. Even if it like totally makes sense and it's really in line with what they want to do, there's this fear of being reliant on them. And then, of course, there's always your concern that they might one day not be able to give. So it, I really do push for diversifying funding as much as possible. Yeah, we did a lot of work at Sendium to get from, it was basically like 90% from our major donor. And then, so peeling it back down to 40% was a lot of work. Um, and they're really happy about it because <laughs> now they don't have to bankroll us anymore. <laughs> All right. 
Next question, which might be our last, is how does a new nonprofit know when it's time to hire a fundraiser? Mm. I disagree. <laughs> I don't think you should, but go ahead. Uh, Wait, ever? Hang on. What? I, <laughs> look, I think that people just, especially new EDs, get very overwhelmed by like everything that a certified fundraising executive certification you know, can bring on, and they look at and compare themselves to all these other organizations. And you're told that you know you've got to do the moves management, you've got to do like have the mail, you've got to you know get this new CRM, da, da, da. and like those are all steps for sure. But it doesn't need to happen all at once. And realistically, there's not a single person on my staff with the title of fundraising. There there is nobody apart from myself who spends as much time on fundraising as I do. But Monica, are you managing director? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But like marketing and communications, you know. Is, is a part of fundraising. So like, I, I question whether it's really, I was told that my first hire needed to be a fundraising person, and maybe that's true, but I didn't do that. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I made the right call, but you all, you all answer. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I would be in, in the same camp as Monica, like I, especially when we're talking about our organizations, which are like in the one to two, you know, just over two million type budget, like, it doesn't, I, I don't think it really makes sense to have a fundraiser or even really a grant writer. I think that it's much more, what's been, so as I said, we just hired a development coordinator who was working with me that they started in January. Um, and they're essentially just helping me build a better framework and understanding of like the fundraising landscape. When there's stuff that comes in and people are like, oh, have you heard of this foundation or this foundation? You know, she goes away and researches them and is like, yes, they are a bit, well, no, they're not. Like, that saves me hours and hours and hours of time um, and frees us up to grow more sustainably. Uh, but yeah, I would, I, would, I would agree with what, what Monica said. Um, and, and this is four years into me being ED, the board on this development coordinator. Um, so we were at 380,000 and then grew kind of incrementally to 1.5 million over the last four years. So to give you a picture of like what that actually looks like. Yeah, I, I think it depends on your organization and the executive director. Not all executive directors are the exact same person. Some That's people really like good point. <laughs> some people not like the size that shop. Yeah, like some people may be weaker in fundraising and maybe they do need a philanthropy person director of development. Some people benefit from a managing director. Some people need an ops director so that they can lead into fundraising. So I think it's okay to think about if you're an ET who's doing it all and is like, oh God, I just need a fundraiser. Is that really what you want support with? Or do you actually want a managing director or an ops director? And so really thinking about what's gonna make sense for you and what's going to allow you to do what you, best, you do best. Um, we've talked about how we should fundraise for our organizations. Like it's not the Monica show, it's not the Brooke show, it's not the Anna show. And so um, a lot of times it is the executive director fundraising, but I think it's okay maybe that there are some people in the movement who are like, nah, I'm gonna do strategy, I, you know, teach them. Any, in our last minute, any final bits of advice or things you wanna share? Well, why don't you tell us to prep for that? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I think, here's my next spicy take, and I have so many, <laughs> this could go on for hours, that'd be good. I think that grant writing is not, you do not need to hire a grant writer when you're just starting out as an organization. I feel like most new EDs I talk to feel like they need to hire grant writers, and that they just apply to more grants and they'll get more grants. And Brooke has basically said, no, that's not true. And I agree. I don't think, I think New Roots has gotten one grant that we weren't invited to apply for. So like the random applying for grants is, often does not work. And realistically, what you should be doing is copying and pasting from your strategic plan. And it shouldn't be something brand new that you're doing all, all the time for every single grant. Um, and that said, I do respect you grant writers. And I also, I also we will be hiring a fundraising person. <laughs> Wow, Monica well, just did that. Um, yeah, I, I also think, like, just to iterate for the last time, that, like, I, I really feel like some of the things that we can say can sound, like, a little bit overwhelming, and, like, everybody is at a very different stage in their journey, and I think 
what you were saying, Brooke, about like every ED is different and has different strengths. I think like spending a moment with yourself and thinking like what is going to work for me uh, and how, how can I, you know, what can I take from this to, to, to help is, is really key. And yeah, I, I appreciate hearing that. And you're all awesome. And let us know how we can help you. Yeah. yeah. We want to be your champions. Yeah. Thank you all so much.